that great mystery of time, were there no other, the illimitable, silent, never-resting thing called time, rolling, rushing on, swift, silent, like an all-embracing ocean tide on which we and all the universe swim like exhalations, like apparitions which are and then are not. This is forever very literally a miracle, a thing to strike us dumb, for we have no word to speak about it. In about 70 words, Thomas Carlyle tells us that there is no word to speak about time. Virtually all the great philosophers and writers of history have nevertheless found something to say about the subject. To be a professional thinker and not talk about time would be like being a politician and not talking about taxes. Painters and sculptors have also grappled with this great mystery. And let's examine some of the different ways the question of time has entered the thinking of artists. Painters, like most people, have often such a distaste for that particular time in history in which they have been placed, all unasking, that they flee through their work to another time, a time that they imagine at least to have been more idyllic, more romantic, more artistic. Here is a painting by Claude Lorrain of some limpid gods and goddesses gathered together on Parnassus, the Greek mountain, sacred in ancient times to Apollo. Claude began life as a pastry cook, and some of his paintings are indeed confections. But the good ones, like this one here at the Museum of Fine Arts, are deeply felt evocations of peaceful, classically ordered landscape. You see these muses here. The landscape, of course, is really the, the landscape of Italy, where he spent much of his time and it's seen through a romantic haze. And the word romantic doesn't have a precise definition. In art, it's usually used to describe works that don't have a precise definition. Harsh contrast of value or tone is avoided. Everything meets gently. The edges soften to a vagueness in which the imagination is free to wander. There have been other very different artists who felt it imperative to face one's own time and record it. And certainly that was one of the main roles of the artists until the invention of photography partially lifted this burden from him. And here we see Napoleon heroically visiting his plague-ridden troops at Jaffa. It was painted by Baron Gros, who painted many works of Napoleon's military campaigns. He was friend and pupil of David, followed him as leader of the classicists, was also on Napoleon's committee to liberate art objects for the Louvre. His use of light and color and movement, his love for exotic locale, were to be an influence on Delacroix and Jericho. Here, the artist's view of his time is somewhat distorted by hero worship and by perhaps too much reverence for the art of the past, and by a sense of theater, of melodrama, which makes his view of the miseries of war much less convincing than those of his Spanish contemporary Goya. If I were to put on some labels, which probably have value only within this program, I'd say that we've looked at a nostalgic view of time in the Claude, a journalistic view of time in the Gros, now let's look at what I would call, in an equally arbitrary way, a poetic view of time. In this work, which is called Poor Man's Store. It's by John Frederick Pito, and it's usually categorized under the style of trompe l'oeil, meaning literally to fool the eye but it's infinitely more than an exercise in illusionistic deception. Pito has enhanced the illusion by placing his canvas of the window and these delicacies on the shelves inside a, an actual framework of wooden boards which he's painted to suggest the exterior wall. 
The time is involved here in at least three ways. In one way, by the beauty of time's effect on the surfaces of life. We don't normally consider peeling paint and rotting wood as beautiful, but when an artist takes a fragment of it and isolates it, or contrasts it with the crisp newness of these humble items on the shelves, then we become conscious of its weathered beauty, very like the patina on an ancient Chinese bronze. In another way, we're affected by the overlapping of time. The building is old, the objects are new, and then we're struck by things like that number five at the top. And we sense the time, we relive it, the time that it took for the nails to loosen and fall off and reveal that patch of new looking wood which was under it all the years. And finally, time is involved in a very artistic sense. And frequently here is music described as the art of time, painting the art of space, but it takes time to travel through this painting. There are quiet passages. There are rhythmic passages. There is a livelier pizzicato passage. And then there are places where the forms become more complicated and takes, it takes longer for the eye to travel around. That was a very subtle, a very poetic statement about the nature of time by John Frederick Pito. Let's look now at a more self-consciously philosophic comment about time in this painting by Gerard Dow, which you might say belongs to the alas poor Yorick school. Dow was a pupil of Rembrandt. The figure of the melancholy young lady is really a, a misunderstood Rembrandt. And as she sits among a, a debris of worldly treasures, apparently she or the artist has reached a, a kind of northern European enlightenment. All these vestiges of temporal existence, the wine pitcher, the violin, the candlestick, have suddenly become meaningless, and among the discarded playing cards, the music sheets, next to the overturned inkstand is the inevitable skull. Perhaps not as moving now as it was when it was painted. The interlocking of time and space in a visual way it's of concern to the modern artist, just as it is to the, to the modern scientist. Let's look at a bit of the, at this question of time and painting, beginning with this, this work. It's difficult to believe that these flowers stayed fresh during the time it must have taken Jan van Huysum to paint them early in the 18th century. It's not just a stupid rendering of surface reality. The light radiates from this brilliant cluster. Dark leaves at the right, illuminated delicately against a lighter background. It says something about the artist's idea of reality, like every painting. It seems to say, flowers are beautiful things, but perishable. Here I've preserved them for your delectation and astonishment. I've, I've neglected nothing, really drops of dew on the petals, insect. I try to get it all down. Even the resemblance between the flower and the butterfly. It's all there for you to enjoy at leisure, a selective mirror held up to nature. I believe this seems to say that reality can be understood as a sequence of facts that can be read one after the other. 
kind of visual encyclopedia. And if we look at this very different painting by Honoré Daumier in the middle of the 19th century, we find a work not meant to be read as a catalog of nature, but a visual event meant to be entered into, to be discovered, to be experienced, to suggest something beyond itself. It's, it's something remembered, something imaginary, but I believe in these courses as I could never believe in those laboratory insects that Van Huysum pinned to his flowers with such care. The Dutch painter tried to lift his work out of time to stop the process of life, of change, and affirmed brilliantly his belief that things have a meaning by themselves. Daumier felt differently. He was more interested in the way the eye sees nature, something focused, something unfocused. He saw life as a constant overlapping of events, relative, always affecting one another. At this point in history, an insidious black box called the camera is beginning its revolution, the importance of which we perhaps haven't fully comprehended. Painters saw for the first time an instant recorded. And there were other artists who this didn't affect, men who felt truth could be grasped by accumulating enough external facts and painting them one by one. But it appealed particularly, a photograph like this, to those painters and poets who'd always felt that reality could be seen only in, in flashes, special moments when man is unguarded in relation to his fellow man, to his world. And here we see a painting by Edgar Degas. Carriages at the races. We know well by now that photographies and Japanese prints fascinated him for their ability to discover the meaningful fragment, usually cut off at the edge, half silhouetted. Early photography didn't catch subtle half tones, and painters were attracted by that look of something seen quickly in passing. This is painting that evokes the passage of time. They will leave soon, not knowing how beautiful they all were for, for just an instant. And we, of course, have other things to do. There's more poetry than, than science in the attempt of the impressionists to seize reality by dividing it into its component colors, exaggerating their freshness, exaggerating the sunlight. Claude Monet sat in front of this haystack for hours, for days, painting different versions of it, seeking the changing nuances of light and color at different hours. The utter simplicity, the humbleness of the object reminds us that the real subject of a painting is never a tree or a village or a face, but what happens between external reality and the mind of the artist. One of the shortest, shortest lived but most mm -hmm. heroic of modern isms was called Futurism, based primarily in Italy. In 1910, no respectable art movement or even a restaurant could open without a manifesto. And I'd like to read a few things from the Futurist Manifesto written by Umberto Boccioni. It deals with questions we've been considering, the artist as mirror of his time, the artist with nostalgia for the past. And then we'll see how the Futurist tried to literally solve the question of time in painting. Remember, this comes from Italy, where the weight of art history bears rather heavily on the young. Only that art is vital. No, excuse me, I'll begin at the beginning. To the young artists of Italy, we want to fight relentlessly against the fanatical 
irresponsible and snobbish religion of the past, which is nourished by the baneful existence of museums. We rebel against the groveling admiration for old canvases, old statues, old objects, and against the enthusiasm for everything moth-eaten, dirty, time-worn, and we regard as unjust and criminal the usual disdain for everything young, new, and pulsating with life. Only that art is vital, which finds its elements in the surrounding environment. As our ancestors drew the matter of their art from the religious atmosphere weighing upon their souls, so we must draw inspiration from the tangible miracles of contemporary life from the iron network of speed enveloping the earth, from the transatlantic liners, the dreadnoughts, the marvelous flights furrowing the skies, the darksome audacities of underwater navigators, the spasmodic struggle for the conquest of the unknown. Here are our peremptory conclusions. <clears throat> Here's some of the conclusions. By our enthusiastic adherence to futurism, we propose to destroy the cult of the past, the obsession with the antique, the pedantry, and the formalism of the academies, to despise utterly every form of imitation, to extol every form of originality, however audacious, however violent, to render and glorify the life of today unceasingly and violently transformed by victorious science. The first conclusion I come to rather self-consciously is that the futurists would like everything about television, except perhaps this program. Let's look at a painting by the author of the manifesto, Umberto Boccioni, and it's called The State of the Soul Departure. I'm sure it seems confusing. You may just to be able to, to make out the image of a locomotive in the center with its serial number. I don't find this confusion too unrealistic because that's what I remember about the departure of trains, the tremendous noise, the steam billowing, the great wheels turning, turning together with the churning emotional upheaval which accompanies farewells. It's good here to remember another line from Boccioni's writings. Everything moves, everything runs, everything turns swiftly. Owing to the persistence of images on the retina, objects in motion are multiplied and distorted, following one another like waves through space. Of course, confusion isn't art. And a great effort has been made here to contain the artist's emotion within a complex linear structure which relates to the simultaneous development of cubism in France. It reminds us of other things. The broken color harks back to Impressionism, but the use of it, the swirling reds, blues, greens, and yellows to convey emotion suggests another new direction, Expressionism. These things don't separate always so tidily. And anyone who thinks that this is modern might remind themselves that it was painted 53 years ago. Giacomo Bala saw a lady walking her dog one day, or vice versa, as it often seems to me, and immediately turned to the problem which artists had dealt with more or less unsuccessfully for centuries, how to convey the, the motion of animate beings. One of the things that distinguished them from the tree to which they are no doubt destined. So he's arrested the legs of this dachshund and his mistress in successive stages of their progression. The effect is something like the blur of motion, like a slowed down motion picture, and somehow it's very funny. Look at that wagging tail seems to have kind of plant-like form. For all his industrious locomotion, he doesn't seem to advance one inch. This painting has for me some of the charm of those brave early flying machines, 
splendid to look at, which hardly ever left the ground. Long before Signor Bala, the new art of photography was attacking this question. And here are the famous horses by Edward Mybridge. These plates from his animal locomotion series were produced in 1887 for use by artists as study material. And of course, the invention of motion picture film was built partly on these achievements. The fast shifting changes of scale and scene, dissolves, montages, were to affect everybody's concept of time, including the artists. But on the other side of the world, long, long ago, an art form had developed which anticipated in many ways the cinematic sense of time. Of course, I mean the horizontal hand scroll in Japan called an emakimono. And here in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts is one of the most famous, the burning of the Sanjo Palace. And our associate producer, Miss Thalia Kennedy, will help me to show some of the, the highlights. Here we have the scene where the rebels are attacking the palace, hoping to abduct the ex-emperor. They have a carriage already. And we see the marvelous movement and vitality. Here is the leader of the, uh, the rebellion, Yoshitomo. And we see the, the juxtaposition of exterior and interior, which the, the Japanese were able to do so beautifully. Here they are inside, the frightened noble women. And it is this overlapping and running together of time that follows all along here. We come to the great flame, the great masterful expressionist painting of the actual burning, which is, which is a triumph in itself. All these things are seen together. Together with the flame, we see the fighting in the courtyard where they, the rebels cut down these fleeing noblemen and their, their court ladies. Then, moving along with this musical progression, we see a scene where they're going outside the gate. We've already jumped to the point where the emperor is kidnapped, and they're taking him away, and we see the procession. Here's some widows who are mourning their, their dead men, and down here we see the heads of possibly their husbands being carried on the, the halberds of the triumphant Minamoto. And there is Inside, of course, the emperor himself being escorted by this triumphant procession. And here we see the most magical, the most beautiful diminishing, where you gradually come down. And gradually, the color lessens, the contrast lessens, and we, we come to this final triumphant note. Of course, we in America have our own emakimono with somewhat more modest pretensions, but nevertheless a uniquely American art form, the comic strip. And modern movie directors in France, people like Alain René, acknowledge that they learn technique of shifting, overlapping, a wonderful telescoping of time and space from these things. Look at this tremendous adjustment of space that we make so easily every Sunday morning. This distant view, suddenly a medium close-up of great action, the lines of, of action depicted quite abstractly, suggesting the movement. And down here, again, close-up, moving across. Then a very extreme close-up, 
and we accept this. We accept this moving back and forth, and because the next instant we're back in a distance. We've, we've learned to see this way. The painter doesn't normally have a series of panels. He has one surface on which to suggest the passage of time, the relativity of objects to each other. This is a late Cubist painting by Jean Metzanger. It shows the Cubist conception of space in which they add a fourth dimension to the three of the Renaissance, the dimension of time. Things no longer seen from one vantage point, but they go around them, they make them transparent. The artist searching for the essential truth of the form, presenting to us several events simultaneously. This clock tolls a time that's not of night or day, but of the mind, the mind remembering, turning it into itself to find the meaning of the dream. It's a pioneer work of surrealism by Giorgio de Chirico. And it's full of the poetry of departure, of loneliness. And surrealism will deserve a program in itself, or several programs. But here, let's look briefly at the Dali, who is one of the heirs to de Chirico and his familiar mixture of Freud and slick academic painting. I don't think the Surrealists ever succeeded in separating the different processes of thought which they hoped to. This painting is called Barcelona Landscape. And it's on loan here from the collection of Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Payne. It's by Robert Newman. It belongs in a program about time and the artist because it's of our time and because the tempo in which it was composed is an integral part of the work. And, of course, one artist who made time his subject magnificently is Alexander Calder. So let's give this time to speak for itself. 